Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Hello everyone, this is Air, and welcome to the 55th episode of Death Row Executions. Today's video on Chester Gillette was sponsored by my patrons from Patreon, and I am super excited for you all to see the very first animated story on this channel. The art is different and unique, so I hope you all enjoy. Also, at the end of the video, I will be sharing the winners for the 40k subs giveaway. Chester Gillette was born on August 9, 1883 in Montana. He was the eldest of four children, and as a fairly young child, his family moved from Montana to Spokane, Washington. Chester grew up in a wealthy family, with one of his uncles even owning a large clothing manufacturing company. His parents eventually got tired of the city life and proving their worth and or status, so they made the decision to renounce the fancy clothes and join the Salvation Army. They dove more into their Christian religion and traveled all over America. Chester never had a permanent school growing up and lived in Hawaii, Washington, Oregon, Wyoming, Montana, California, Ohio, and New York. He drifted further away from his parents' way of thinking and was not as religious as them. In one surviving family photo, his siblings and parents were all wearing Salvation Army issued uniforms, but Chester was the only one in a three-piece suit. In 1901, his parents later came up with the decision that Chester have a steady life without traveling, so they reached out to his uncle who in turn paid for Chester to attend the Oberlin College Preparatory School in Ohio. He excelled at the school and even became captain of his basketball team. He was into tennis and was very popular amongst his peers. Two years after attending school there, in 1903 at the age of 20, Chester dropped out. Instead of focusing on studies, he decided that he would rather work and make money himself. He had a few odd jobs before reaching out to his uncle Horace in New York who owned a skirt factory. He began working at his uncle's skirt factory for $10 a week, and around the same time, a young woman by the name of Grace Brown began working there as well. Grace grew up in a small farm town where everyone knew each other. She grew tired of the farm life, and when her sister Ada got married and moved to the city, she decided to follow in her sister's footsteps in 1904 at the age of 18. She bought new clothes to fit in, and began working at the skirt factory making a few dollars a week, which was more than she had ever made before. Chester noticed Grace immediately and always seemed to have the perfect excuse to be in her workstation. The two flirted and eventually began a secret sexual relationship. Not too soon after their sexual relationship began, Grace's sister lost her baby boy, so she and her husband moved back to their family farm. Grace was faced with the difficult decision of whether or not to move back home as well, but decided to stay in the city a few blocks away from the skirt factory as a boarder in someone's house. Her relationship with Chester continued, and in 1906 at the age of 20, Grace became pregnant with Chester's child. Chester's treatment towards Grace changed, and many employees went to Grace and warned her to be careful of Chester because he did not appear to be the person he portrayed. They noticed him yelling at her, and overall, Grace's mental health began to decline. In a time where women who had children out of wedlock were shunned or not treated fairly, Grace left the city to live with her parents. When she made it back home, all she could do was cry and write letters to Chester. She was not able to open up to her mother, who had been pleading with her to let her know what was going on. Chester, not thinking too much about being a father-to-be, started to have sexual relationships with other women at the skirt factory, unbeknownst to Grace. He was also attending parties, hanging out with friends, swimming at popular lakes, and casually playing tennis. She had been writing Chester for a week with no response. Some letters threatened to tarnish Chester's family name by exposing him to the community for getting a young woman pregnant. Some were depressing, saying she no longer wanted to live, and some were asking him to fix the situation they were in. 
One letter that was dated June 20th, 1906 read, My dear Chester, I am writing to tell you that I am coming back to Cortland. I simply can't stay here any longer. Mama worries and wonders why I cry so much and I am just about sick. Please come and take me away to some place, dear. I came up home this morning and I just can't help crying all the time just as I did that night. My headache is dreadful tonight. I am afraid you won't come and I am so frightened, dear. I know you will think it queer, but I can't help it. You have said you will come and sometimes I just know you will, but then I think of other things and I am just as certain you won't come. I want you to write me, dear, just as soon as you get this and tell me the exact day you can come. I will come back in a little while. I can't stay here, dear, and please don't ask me too much longer. Grace felt that the only solution was to move back near Chester and for them to marry. Chester felt uneasy with her threats, and instead of continuing to ignore her, he finally gave in and responded, but it was still not the response Grace was expecting. The letter from Chester was very short, had no emotion, and made Grace feel worse. He initially told her to take a trip with her parents and stay with them, but with Grace not letting up about them getting married, Chester finally wrote that he would take her to a maternity ward in upstate New York and marry her. Grace was excited, but sent one of her final letters to Chester because she was not able to tell her mother she was pregnant and believed she and Chester would run off together. The letter read, I know I shall never see any of them again, and Mama, great heavens, how I do love Mama. I don't know what I shall do without her. Sometimes I think if I could tell Mama, but I can't. She has trouble enough as it is, and I couldn't break her heart like that. If I come back dead, perhaps if she does not know, she won't be angry with me. Chester made arrangements to get Grace, and the two stayed at a hotel for the night before traveling to Tupper Lake in Franklin County. Due to the rain, they were unable to enjoy the lake, so traveled to Big Moose Lake instead, which was in a different county. They stayed at a hotel called the Lakeside Glenmore Hotel and settled for the night. Grace was unaware of the fact that Chester registered with a fake name and the fake name matched his real initials of C and G, which were monogrammed on his suitcase. Grace was excited of what was to come and knew in her heart that Chester had planned a romantic getaway and would propose to her. Chester came equipped with nice clothes and even a tennis racket for leisure play. The next day, on July 11, 1906, Chester rented a rowboat and the two rowed their boat on Big Moose Lake. After a bit of rowing, Chester took his racket and hit Grace on the head, knocking her out and overturning the boat. Chester swam to shore while Grace unfortunately drowned. On July 12th, a 13-year-old boy by the name of Roy Higby was walking by the lake and noticed something white in the water. He called for help and men got in rowboats to figure out what the object was. When they got closer, men jumped in the water to retrieve Grace and brought her on board. She was recognized, and they began looking in the water for her significant other, Carl Graham, who had checked into the hotel, but all they could find was a hat and a coat that belonged to him. After an autopsy was conducted, they discovered Grace suffered from blunt force trauma to the head, so the accidental drowning turned into a homicide investigation. While this was happening, Chester, who made it clear that he was not ready to settle down and be with one woman, made a trek through the woods and met up with friends alongside the mountains before checking into the Arrowhead Hotel under his real name, Chester Gillette. He was cool, calm, and collected, and no one suspected anything out of the ordinary. He mingled with girls, and no one questioned anything about Grace. Investigators quickly put the pieces together and realized that Carl Graham was Chester Gillette and he was soon arrested in Inlet, New York and was sent to jail. Initially, Chester was prevented from speaking to any press and was only allowed visitors from family and his legal representation. His family, however, did not support him and his wealthy uncle refused to pay for an attorney, so he was appointed a public defender. The district attorney prosecuting the case spent time getting testimonies from everyone Chester knew and from witnesses in the area he visited. Eventually, while being locked up, he was allowed to speak with the press and although expressing his innocence, 
He was very detailed with them about his relationship with Grace and gave his vacation itinerary to them as well. A week after being arrested, the district attorney prosecuting Chester had enough evidence and trial began. Chester's lawyers tried to argue that Grace ended her own life and that Chester was just a witness. In Chester's own words, he said, I tried to reach her then and, well, I was not quick enough. I went into the lake too. The boat tipped over as I started up or when I started to get up. The boat went right over then. Of course, I went into the lake too. Then I came up. I hallowed, grabbed hold of the boat. Then, as soon as I could see, to get the water out of my eyes and see, I got hold of the boat, or got to the boat. I did not see her. I stayed there at the boat, but a minute or two. It seemed like a long time anyway, and I did not see her. Then I swam to shore. Although Chester said this, he later shot himself in the foot by claiming he was not at the lake with Grace at all. He was also unable to communicate why she had the bruise on her head and told prosecutors he sold his tennis racket so he had no idea why she had a bruise. Chester was eventually found guilty for murdering Grace and was sentenced to die by method of the electric chair. He was sent to Auburn State Prison and his appeals were not granted. Governor Charles Evan Hughes also refused to grant Chester clemency. While awaiting death, he spent time writing in his diary and receiving letters from women who thought he was innocent. His last letter was dated on Monday, March 30th, 1908, the morning of his execution, and it read, went to bed at 12.30 and was asleep in a few minutes, slept soundly until called at 3.45, feel refreshed and calm. I am surprised that I can look at this matter so calmly, had communion for the first time, had a very nice little breakfast and appreciate everyone's kindness. They have all been so kind and courteous. I am very grateful to each one. He died later that morning and his last words were, tell my mother I am prepared to meet my God. Thank you guys for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. And if you did enjoy this story, please give the video a like for me. So I uploaded a murder mystery giveaway in honor of reaching 40k subs and I got the answer I had written down with the story that I had just read in mind. Mrs. Claus and Sam the Snowman were having an affair. Mrs. Claus kept reassuring Sam that she would leave Santa but she could never work herself up to doing so because she did not want to be portrayed as a villain. Santa had gained weight, did not help around the house, and acted very different to the world than behind closed doors. While Sam was thinking in Santa's sleigh, he came to the realization that enough was enough and Mrs. Claus deserved better. He grabbed an icicle and went inside Santa's house, but was startled by Rudolph and with instinct threw the icicle towards Rudolph, breaking his antler in the process. At that moment, the blackout happened, so Rudolph did not clearly see who hurt him. He ran outside in pain and lit his nose for people to find him. Santa was in the chimney when he heard Rudolph whimper, so he came down and that's when Sam thought of framing Rudolph. He grabbed Rudolph's antler and stabbed Santa. He quickly ran outside to convene with everyone else in the search for Santa. So the killer was Sam the snowman, the weapon was Rudolph's antler, and the location was Santa's house. Out of over 200 comments, there was only one person who guessed Sam the Snowman in Santa's house and with an antler. And that was Sidney Hughes. Yay! Congratulations, Sidney. Thank you so much for interacting. Actually, thank you to all of you guys for interacting with me and just having fun. It was so funny to read all of the other scenarios. There were some pretty awesome ones. So a couple of weeks ago, I played the same game. What I guessed was Sam the Snowman and Icicle in Santa's sleigh. And my scenario was this exact scenario. So Santa was overprotective of his sleigh, so he confronted Sam, they fought, and Sam killed him with the icicle that was on the sleigh. So as a consolation prize, ma'am, yes ma'am, I will be sending you some money as well. Thank you again to my patrons on Patreon for sponsoring today's video, and I would like to give a shout out to some new patrons, Kim in Dogtown, Delbert, Kristen, Tom, thank you all for becoming patrons on my Patreon.